Okay, so thank you again for joining. I'm David from EduSource, and I have with me Kay Peterson, the founder and CEO for the Institute for Experiential Learning. I think this organization is already familiar to some of you, and for those of you who aren't familiar, Kay will be providing some insight about what their organization does. Um, I thought that this could be an interesting session. Normally, our webinars, if for those of you who have joined us before, normally we have a client organization on a school talking about how they approach experiential learning, and it's usually away from the learning side and a little bit more about just issuing these projects, overseeing them, kind of the logistical challenges. Kay will be talking to you uh, solely about the learning items. So I hope that'll be of interest to you. Some housekeeping items. You can ask questions as we go. There's a questions box in your GoToWebinar panel. If you click that and type in a question, I'll be able to see that and then read that back to the audience. And Kay will address any questions you have. Uh, we will be pausing in the middle and at the end, but send us questions throughout and then we'll get to those points and, and pause and go as needed. And then at the very end, I'll be sharing with you some insights from our experiential learning annual survey, just a preview of those results. And with that, Kay, uh, go ahead and take it away. Oh, thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I'm happy to be talking about this topic that we love so much, experiential learning. Um, the Institute for Experiential Learning is really committed to promoting experiential learning through training and consulting, even coaching, assessment, and research. So uh, we are in the business of making sure um, that learning is explicit, and especially this uh, experiential learning model uh, developed by David Kolb some 50 years ago. We serve clients in higher ed and even in K through 12 education. We also have clients um, in organizations, especially leadership and management um, in HR, talent development, OD, and even coaching. We find that um, a lot of people are using experiential learning programs, but they don't um, actually employ the experiential learning model, and we think this can be a very, very powerful framework for all experiential learning programs in higher ed and um, in industry as well. So I always find it ironic to be talking about experiential learning in this webinar format because this is really a, um, a I'm delivering information, um, and it's not actually using experiential learning. But sadly, we're limited by time and a little bit by technology. So this will probably be a little bit more abstract than experiential. Um, David and I were laughing about this yesterday about how um, we're really going to be talking about concepts. But I do want to frame this as being extremely practical. We find that this is one of the most practical tools you can employ for tremendous results. So um, why is it that we link le learning to teamwork? Well, it turns out that the way we learn is the way we make decisions and solve problems, partner, parent, and certainly work on a team. Virtually every activity that a team undertakes requires new learning from team members and from the team as a whole. But learning is so implicit for most of us. Few of us actually think about it. But we, we do, in fact, and our work is all about making learning explicit. I really like this picture for a few reasons. One um, has to do with the water itself. In, in a commencement speech at Kenyon College, David Foster Wallace told a story about two young fish who were swimming along, and they passed an older fish. He nods and says, morning, boys, how's the water? The two young fish swim on for a bit, and eventually one says to the other, what the heck is water? I think this story illustrates um, that the obvious and mo most important realities are often the hardest to see and talk about. But just like a fish swimming in water, who will probably be the last one to recognize water, we, we're swimming in our own stream of conscious experience, surrounded by what is in our everyday lives. But to learn, we actually have to be stuck or struck, as we say, to be lulled out of this implicit um, mindset and behavior. And when we make learning figural, it really provides contrast 
um, with this ground that we're in all the time. The picture also suggests to me that we spend a lot of time with others, swimming and working and playing with them. And it also suggests the tensions that exist between uh, our individual needs sometimes and those of the team. And the fact is that we need to consider both to be successful in teamwork, often zooming out to take um, new perspective. But how can we take this new perspective on teamwork? when employers are list teamwork and collaboration among the top five skills they seek in new employees. I think having experience on a team doesn't necessarily translate into developing the skill. In fact, many people experience teamwork as negative when their experience is surrounded by interpersonal conflict or poor outcomes. It, it turns out that many people actually learn how to be part of teams playing sports when they can transfer learning from a field into learning in life and in teamwork. I just, I'd like to play a short clip for you from a recent PBS NewsHour broadcast where John Erdell discusses this. Please watch and just pay attention to what you notice about what he says. When I was a kid growing up in Buffalo, I spent a lot of time alone. It wasn't easy for me to make friends. I was awkward, bigger than everyone else. I didn't know how to talk to the other kids. I was happiest by myself, doing math puzzles or playing video games. Then when I got to middle school, I joined lacrosse and soccer teams. I wanted to play football, but we couldn't find a helmet that fit. I didn't do it because I was some great athletic talent. In fact, I wasn't. I was overweight and out of shape. I was seriously competitive, and I loved playing games. I loved winning, and even more than that, I hated losing. That had been true when I was a child playing Monopoly with my mother, but it became especially clear when I was playing sports. What I hadn't expected, though, was how much I loved being part of a team, and how much I learned from it, especially when I joined the football team in high school. I had to learn how to communicate better, I had to learn when to take the lead on the field and in the locker room, and when to step back and give my support. I had to learn how to accept instruction and criticism from coaches, and there was a lot of it. I had to work hard, because if I didn't, I'd be letting my teammates down. Don't get me wrong, I didn't always like the guys I was playing with. That didn't matter, though. We were in it together. I'm convinced that every kid would benefit from being part of a team. Not because of what playing team sports did for me as a football player, but because of what it did for me as a mathematician. It might seem like being a mathematician is a solitary pursuit. It's true, I spend a lot of time in a room by myself. But what I didn't expect is that I would also spend a lot of time working with other mathematicians. In other words, being on a team. It may sound crazy, but playing football helped me write my first research paper on the Sun-Jupiter asteroid three-body problem. It took diligence and learning how to deal with feedback. People spend years in classrooms trying to gain the skills that will help them succeed. But some of the most important skills, I believe, are best learned on a field. So John Erdell talks about all these skills that are required in teamwork. And it start to understand how complicated it really is, how to communicate, lead, when to lead and when to step back, when to accept instruction and criticism, um, to be accountable, even when you don't necessarily care for the people that you're working with, um, and when to give and receive feedback. So it's, um, it's not, uh, it's actually not just a natural skill for people to learn. And sports are wonderful opportunities for learning about teams that we can transfer over. But what if we didn't require being on a football team or being on a sports team to learn about teamwork? What if we made learning how to be a team member and how to be effective teams as important as the task we give to teams to accomplish? What if we included this learning, the process of team learning, to give students the opportunities to be on teams rather than expecting them to come to higher ed prepared to 
to be great team members? Well, this is what we do at the Institute for Experiential Learning. We believe that it's important to make the process of learning itself explicit. And then we can apply that to teams as well. We've created a, a team process that can do this um, to allow people to learn about themselves, how teams operate to develop a shared mental model of team process, and then how to implement that. Um, we are, we understand everyone is so busy um, and it's really hard to have the bandwidth to include any other content in uh, the programming that is already offered at, um, at higher, higher ed organizations. And so we are actually in the process of developing an online program that will take this concept to scale. So teaming is everywhere, from formal teams, projects, to informal collaborations. And the more we know about ourselves and the process, the more we can be effective. So I'd like to, at this point, just come back into now the general concepts that we use to set this up. Um, I try to make them as practical as, um, and relevant as possible, but it begins with learning how to learn. And this is um, really the, the foundation of all we do, is the learning cycle that David Kolb created around 50 years ago. He understood that uh, learning was more than thinking alone. It also required our perceptions, our feelings, our thoughts, um, and our actions. This is such a simple four-step cycle that it's really easy for people to learn this in five minutes or so. Um, but it starts with experiencing. We have an experience, then we step back to reflect on that and make sense. From there, we um, generalize, form concepts and theories. And then we have to take those three internal processes and take them to the external world where there are real results for our actions and that in a sense create, creates the next experience. So while this is a simple um, uh, four-step process, it really is a sometimes more dynamic and messier. It doesn't always occur in the exact, uh, um, this exact order, but the important thing is actually touching all these steps, touching all the bases. I said it was um, a, a very simple thing to learn, but it's really not as easy to employ this as, as um, one might seem, one might think at first. And that's because it's comprised of two pairs of interdependent opposites, experiencing and thinking and reflecting and acting. And experiencing and thinking are ways we take in information. One is a, through direct experience, um, what and which is what we're all um, offering in industry-based projects. Another is through thinking, which are, um, and we're detached here, looking at concepts and ideas, facts, even words. Um, and reflecting and acting are ways that we process or transform experiencing and thinking. Reflecting is through listening and process, internal processing. Acting, of course, is through testing options by doing. And so the way in which we um, form preferences for using this cycle really makes a big difference in how we use the cycle. But this, this even by itself, is an incredibly powerful uh, process to uh, use when planning or deploying experiential learning programs. And we've taken this cycle and created a team learning process that uses the basic cycle, but we've, we've applied different steps to the process to create a team process. That of creating, planning, deciding, and acting. In creating, of course, we um, are looking at different options, um, looking at what might be possible. In um, planning, we are 
gathering information and considering um, stakeholders' perspectives, what we need in um, deciding. We're using models and theories to make decisions and define measures of success. And in acting, of course, we're implementing our plan and creating the next round of team learning. And teams go through this cycle many, many times in any project. They might use it as a guide for team meetings, or they might use it many times through the, um, through the life of a project. But you can already see that there are tensions exist even in this cycle between creating and deciding and planning and doing. And so what happens as a team if we overfocus on one aspect of the team learning process or skip another step? Well, in creating, if we overfocus on it, we're creative, but we get no results. We may focus on relationships and allow them to trump independent analysis. And by it, we might become biased or um, not, we don't attend to content. If, but if we skip creating altogether, we may lack new ideas instead of moving, um, moving around in some order where we generate new ideas. And this is a very, very typical uh, pattern for MBA teams, I might say. In planning, if we overfocus, of course, we can go into um, analysis paralysis. But if we skip planning, we'll, we're going to lack information gathering or perspective taking. Teams may neglect to think of important stakeholders or make sense of what the information tells them. We might rely on anecdotal information or gut level hunches about what the situation requires. And on to deciding. Of course, if we overfocus on deciding, we move immediately to a decision without considering new choices. But if we skip deciding the deciding step, we're either not reaching a conclusion or identifying a clear goal. How do we know what to do to take action if we skip this step? Um, we've all seen teams that can't move to the decision making um, move to decision making because they either have interpersonal conflict, or they're stuck in the planning stage. And needless to say, they're not effective, and it's frustrating to be part of an experience like that. Then finally, in acting, if we overfocus on acting, we'll be very quick, but we may be aiming at the wrong goal or shooting from the hip. Likewise, if we skip acting entirely, we're not accountable with implementation. And I often see this happen when teams have actually made a decision and begin to implement, but they see that things may not go perfectly. And this sends them back into the creating or planning stage before they finish implementation. Um, and again, you can see that's where pilot programs come in handy. So I believe, David, you've put up a question for the group to answer about what issues that um, you find are the biggest obstacles for your teams? Yeah, that question is up right now. And for the audience, for those of you that have questions about the content you've heard so far, go ahead and, and send that to us while we're reviewing this and we'll get to those questions. Um, and, and Kay, the first question that came in is, how is working with educational institutions and employers different or similar? Hmm. Well, um, I think um, one thing is that, um, I, I think there are a lot of similarities, honestly, David. Certainly in education, um, educators often have a particular way of doing things. And so we find that it's actually very important for educators to learn this model and process along with students because it's really, um, approaching um, learning together and making the content the focus instead of it's an expert delivery model. And um, while many educators are uh, um, familiar with the learning cycle in terms of instructional design, oftentimes um, they don't make the model explicit. 
And we find that that is a really a very powerful approach to take. Um, and I will say, educators are often much more open to the idea of learning and um, learn the learning cycle and learning styles. Um, when we work with professionals in other disciplines, they often think learning is so implicit that um, they've done all that. And that's something they've always known how to do. And so it takes perhaps a little more convincing and some experiences to let them know that um, there's value in looking at the model itself. Okay, and do you have any thoughts on these results from our quick poll? Oh, well, so um, it's interesting, no trust or psychological safety. That tells me that that, that is actually, they're spending time getting to know each other as teams. No planning can be very typical, especially under time pressures, when we have you know, really urgent conditions or um, people are pressed, it's very easy to skip that planning phase. And, and there's also a sense that we already know what to do. And so it's e easy to step the stop, um, skip that creating and planning phase and move right to implementation. No clear goals. Um, that again would be um, represented in kind of skipping that the, the uh, deciding phase where we might have a general idea of where we're going but we don't have clear a clear goal or know how to measure success and that's something that we've clearly stated also in our process and certainly a lack of follow-through uh, can be so frustrating john or dell talked about that being accountable to each other on a team um, but it really takes um, everybody moving through this process together. And when, when one of the steps is missing, you can see how team learning doesn't take place and team outcomes are less effective. Okay. And so I have a any, does anything stick out, for, anything stand out for you? Well, the thing is, I think some of these uh, potential responses could be, taken a few different ways. So clear goals, you know, is that the overarching project goal or is that an intermediate series of goals? But I think, and this is referencing some of the survey data I'll have at the end, um, a lot of the, we asked an open-ended question, you know, what do you, what do you struggle with or have advice for based on what you've seen in your program? And a common response, even though this was open-ended free text, a lot of people talked about having a client on board with an actual project, not something made up, but something they really mm -hmm. need and therefore were engaged in getting to a result. Um, and if if that's the case, then not having, you know, if people are complaining that that's a struggle, then not having clear goals, you know, to me that lines up with that result that maybe the, the projects um, aren't clearly defined enough up front. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, maybe this also means not having intermediate goals throughout. Um, I have a question for you based on a few slides back. You mentioned infra information paralysis, but then you've kind of got to walk a line between the uh, teams having enough information versus not having too much so that they're really not just truly boxed in. Do you have any advice on how to draw mm -hmm. that line between providing too much data and not enough to the student? Oh, that's a great question. That is a great question. Um, well, it's it's actually uh, obviously it's context dependent, but being aware of the the um, I think being aware of the issue, David, is really powerful. For instance, if you know you need to move around this cycle, you know that that is a step in the process, but it's not the whole process. So in that instance, I might consult an expert. Um, I might that might be a good place for some kind of consultation that the team has with um, an expert who has more um, experience in the industry. Um, what, what else have you seen that, that um, helps people move from under, just actually having clear discussions with the, um, the organization, I think is important because that's certainly an area where you have to partner with each other to understand what, of it, what information is available and what is not um, is is a little more hidden. 
Yeah, we're, we're back on your screen, so if you could hit presenter view. Um, I know that the switching to the polling interrupts that, which is kind of an odd design choice for GoToWebinar. So my, my answers are going to be exactly the same as what you just said, which is going to sound like a huge cop-out. But mm -hmm. I think having an expert involved, uh, you know, we call that a mentor in our tool. And actually, again, mm -hmm. thinking about that survey, a lot of people brought that up as a key point, having somebody mm -hmm. with credible industry expertise involved yeah. with the team to help fill in those gaps where there are gaps and there are always are gaps because these projects are kind of by nature open-ended and i think the other thing to do and you said this too is have uh, client involvement and i i would take that a step further i would say have clear intermediate uh meetings with that client a lot of our schools that that run you know really tight ships on these programs they're having the client organization meet with the student teams on some regular basis. I think when we've done projects as a company, I think we've looked at weekly meetings maybe. Um, and I think a lot of our schools do weekly or biweekly meetings, you know, not, not every organization, I mean, there are a lot of organizations a lot larger than us that sponsor projects. They might not have time to meet every week, but even if it's every two weeks or three weeks, but having that spelled out in advance, students can accumulate their questions and issues, and then they know what's coming. And I'm sure a lot of the schools represented on this audience, they're already doing that. So it's kind of preaching to the choir. But I think when schools are launching new programs, that's a big question is how really engaged will the client be? And again, that came through in the survey data. But that's a, I'll go back, though, to this team learning process and using this with the um, sponsoring organization and the team, the internal team in the company can be so helpful. This can actually be a meeting process map as well. You know, you can go in and, and look at under creating, just look at where are we right now? What is what's happening right now? looking at planning, um, where, what, else, what other information do we need that we don't have? Uh, do we have adequate information? What is our intermediary goal, intermediate goal? Are we, how will we know that we're moving in the right direction? And now what do we need to do until we meet again? So you see how helpful this can be. It's quite simple. And in the team learning uh, report that we have, we've actually made this a little more granular in a step-by-step -step fashion um, that actually has nine steps aligning with the learning styles that we'll go into now. Is that helpful information? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. Well, um, so why is it that we experience tensions in this um, team learning cycle? Why do we avoid parts of it and focus on others? Well, we all have preferences for how we use the cycle based on our comfort with using those four modes, the experiencing, reflecting, thinking, and acting. Um, and these are defined by um, learning styles. And learning styles um, really are different ways of approaching the world in general and learning specifically. And you can kind of break them into um, the ways of focusing on relationships, on um, information analysis or action and you can see this aligns with our team learning cycle as well but this photo was taken where four people are standing at the intersection of four different western states coming at things from very different perspectives and i like this visual because it really does capture how different learning the different learning styles can be and these preferences that we have um, once again, learning styles are ways of approaching this learning cycle and the team learning cycle. And they are um, absolutely ways of processing or you know, taking in and processing information. But learning styles are different from other typologies in that they're not trait-based. So these do not people put people in boxes or pigeonholes or stereotypes. So when you're working with a team, I think this is such an important thing. These are research-based um, styles, but they're not, um, every. there's no right or wrong style. And every style is needed, and every style has upsides or downsides. They're really habits or states instead of traits. So you can see there are nine different learning styles. The initiating, experiencing, imagining styles are really different ways of dealing with relationships. Imagining, reflecting, analyzing, have a preference for information, analyzing, thinking, deciding, really um, focus on analysis, 
and deciding, acting, initiating uh, are really focused on outcomes. And you can see I've overlaid two, uh, this, the, so to speak, corner styles twice because they're all close cousins to each other. Then the balancing style in the middle really doesn't go to the extremes of any one style, but they all have upsides and downsides and all bring strengths to any situation. Um, so one of the things that we do in um, this new team learning report that we've created is to map out the styles um, of a team. And so here is one example of an MBA team. And this is, I have to say, one of the most powerful and impactful things that I've ever used in um, consulting and coaching and training uh, learning styles because they raise self-awareness. They help people to see, again, the water they're swimming in and help them to understand that other people are coming from very different viewpoints. But you can see here that this team is distributed really around the learning cycle with probably a preference to um, these southern styles of deciding, thinking, and analyzing, and also moving to action. Um, and this, I would say this is a pretty typical MBA team, probably might be typical of engineering students as well, but um, you can see Kelly is up in the imagining style, and she might be feeling a little lonely up there, actually. Mustafa and uh, Romy and Philip are in analyzing and thinking, and <clears throat> excuse me, they'll bring great strengths to the team of looking at information and analyzing it, understanding, again, these might be the people to take charge as they um, have discussions with experts in their in the field to understand how much information they need. Um, Barbara, Reggie, and Jing are really going to be focused on getting to the task, moving to implementation. Um, and Carlos, again, will be able to take the lead when they um, go into implementation. But without understanding these preferences, it would be easy for the team to actually under see, be coming from different places, and they might not appreciate each other so much. In fact, um, without intention, this team might completely skip the steps of the team process that are associated with initiating, experiencing, and even imagining, because Kelly is just one person out of eight, and the reflecting and balancing steps. And so when, these, um, when the team members understand their styles, they're able to have a conversation about what their strengths are, what steps in the process um, are they can take leadership or share leadership um, in and being intentional also about skipping, about not skipping any steps. And here you'll see just a small sampling of the strengths of the imagining style that Kelly brings, which are generating new ideas and seeking other opinions, really being inclusive, imagining what might be instead of just jumping immediately to that task and implementation phase. And again, Kelly can take leadership um, in, this, in this area, and yet she has challenges too in making decisions, and she'll have to watch herself that when they get down to making a decision, she doesn't reopen discussions and think, oh wait, I think we could do this better. Let's go back here now. And let, she'll, we'll need to complete one cycle before you're going back. So this is actually a very, very um, powerful discussion to have. And you can see that um, when team member styles are similar, it leaves them with strengths in certain parts of the, this full cycle of the team cycle, and maybe no skills in others. This team is really quite a specialized team rather than a diverse team. And when it's specialized, the team members need to make learning explicit and intentionally focus on each step, even when no one on the team is strong in those skills. This is really the key to team learning effectiveness, is to monitor your ability to um, use every step in the process. 
And in this team, we see Kelly with her preference for imagining style, which means that she is the one um, that takes in information through feeling and transforms it through reflecting. So she's gonna be the one to attend to feelings and people and the environment and bring in the subjective information that is so, um, so important. But others on the team, Romy, Philip, Mustafa, Barbara, Reggie, Jing, they're going to be worried about quantitative data, evidence, theories, and models. Um, and it's really precisely why everybody needs each other. Um, and it's this bringing together when this team can collectively monitor their learning experience. This is when the teams develop executive consciousness, the shared understanding of how teams work most effectively. Learning style, it's easy, however, to become entrenched in a learning style when we're very successful using it. And in fact, when we have a preferred style that's very specialized, we actually look for situations that will allow us to be successful. So we're constantly scanning for that and even avoiding situations where we might not be as successful. Entrenchment occurs when you habitually cling to one automatic preferred approach to learning and to life, actually. Um, the effectiveness of the style is limited to situations that require its strength and capabilities. But we know through research that, first of all, we don't just use one style. We also have backup styles. And we featured these backup styles also in the team learning report, so it's easy for teams to understand where people can share leadership. Learning flexibility is actually the ability to use all nine learning styles to creatively match your approach to any situation. And we know from research that the benefits of learning flexibility are huge. Um, it, it leads to greater flexibility in life, more fulfilling personal relationships, less conflict and stress, even in more complex life situations, and the ability to manage more complexity. So this idea of being more self-directed and um, leads us to more maturity. And you can see how this really contributes to people in their first jobs, to being having satisfying life, lives. We also know that teams that have um, more diversity in, um, in membership, it's a new way of looking at diversity and in fact allows, instead of focusing on demographic diversity, we can look at deep psychological diversity. And when teams are more diverse in learning styles, they actually are more successful and effective in handling complex situations. So it's a really very exciting research. Um, this particular team happened to be, um, Kelly happened to be a real person working on a um, master's project team. And you can see that the impact was quite, um, uh, quite impressive just from their the anecdotal data that they were able to understand each other so much better and resolve, resolve any kind of interpersonal conflict, they actually created conflict in a way that allowed them to differ in their opinions and not take it personally, which is a real important part of psychological safety. Then they also actually aligned their presentation and workshop, workshop around their learning styles and the learning cycle and had perhaps the best feedback possible from the client organization that they actually seemed like a well-seasoned team. So again, we've created this team learning assessment and report um, to allow this, um, this kind of um, experience to happen for a team before they start working or as they form. Um, this will be available. Actually, we're just coming out with it. It'll be available um, in July. And um, we're, we're very excited. We're launching this at our conference um, in a couple weeks for the Experiential Learning Conference. Um, and then it will be available for purchase uh, for teams. And we hope that it just becomes such an important part of any team conversation, especially in 
you know, internship teams and in industry group teams where um, people are coming together for a short time. They have to go in and do important work. It's um, you're building relationships all the time with client organizations, and it really helps to tee up a positive experience. In this team learning um, report, we actually instruct teams to have three primary conversations, and each one of these conversations takes them around the entire team learning process. One, of course, is on their style profile, what strengths they can bring to the team, where they might have challenges, how the team will develop this executive consciousness to know that um, they need to stop at every step in the process. Um, then I did identifying team purpose, and David, I think this speaks to uh, one of the things you were talking about is understanding what the purpose of the team is and what goals they're um, going to accomplish. Then a third conversation, which is actually one that is omitted in even very seasoned teams, and that is one of having a team process review. In the military is famous for after action reviews. Well, we've created an after process review to understand how we're using the cycle. And again, as you remember, everyone has preferences for using the cycle. And when time is urgent and uh, they're pressed for time, teams can really skip over some of these steps. So it, it really helps to have a process review on an individual and team um, basis. And well, David Kolb and I um, wrote a couple books about um, how, how you learn is how you live. To make learning the learning cycle and learning styles very accessible um, in a simple fashion um, and, and try to make them very, very practical. So I'll stop here and turn it over to you, David. I'd be happy to uh, take any questions that anyone has. So two questions came in that are kind of similar. I'll just read them both to you and, and you can respond. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Is there an assessment tool available for teams to try, either free or paid? And if so, how do teams access it? And then the next question was, how do I get uh, the team learning model? How would, how would we engage with you to use it? So any, any thoughts? Absolutely. Well, we are actually in our pilot um, program right now, and I'd love to make the team learning assessment available. Um, may I offer it to the, say, the first three people who contact me? Um, and then after um, we have it available, I'm happy to make it um, available to anybody. We will be, it'll be available on our website. It'll be a self-administered um, uh, team you know, anyone can sign up for it to use it. We're happy also to educate people in how to use it most effectively. Um, but if you, if anybody has an interest in taking the learning styles inventory or using the team learning assessment, just contact us. And I, I felt like the presentation was so inundated with data today, I didn't get more granular on all these nine steps, but if you will um, just contact me, I, I'll, I will also make the um, full model available to anyone who's interested and try it out and just um, give us some feedback on how, how it uh, changed your experience. Okay, and we'll be sending out uh, your email to everyone in the audience oh. to make sure that the that that line of communication is open. Um, question I have is how do you communicate or recommend communicating the learning cycle to students? So how is it actually implemented at the student level? Yeah, well, this is, it's interesting and we are working with organizations now who are, you know, have experiential learning programs, but they're actually making this, they're making it explicit. So it does take some time. We have some online uh, programs that students can use. We're actually coming out with an incredibly um, interactive um, model that um, will be available in the fall. So if anyone wants to be part of that pilot uh, program, we are, we'd be, uh, we would welcome your participation. Um, but I think it's actually an, a pretty easy thing to teach. Um, obviously, you can do it through creating an experience, actually putting people through the learning cycle. 
um, creating an experience, having students reflect on that, then giving some, you can actually then give them the model and have them take some action on it. So it's, it's a really quite natural way to learn, but it is a little different than just the expert delivery model of lecture tests, lecture test. But I would make it explicit and actually make it part of a, um, a, a learning module. Next question is, how do you accommodate for culturally different, uh, for example, domestic versus non-domestic team members? Well, I think this is a great equalizer, actually. Do you, are you talking about referring to styles? You mean style differences, David? In well, this how... was an audience question, not my own, so I'm not sure the, the uh, questioner can follow up with more insight if needed. Right. The, um, well, there, are, there have been studies done on actual cultural differences with learning style preferences. So some, there are some differences uh, that may show up, but actually, um, of course, every learning style brings strengths to a team process. And so at an individual level, um, as I coach individuals, I really try to help them develop learning flexibility to use online styles. And when we come to a team experience, it's really easier to come with our strengths. And so anyone is going to come to the team process with strengths that they can use and share leadership. So in some ways, I think this is a, a great equalizer for um, understanding uh, differences and appreciating them. Okay, and a uh, question for me, this, you know, like we talked about as we've gone through this content, it, it this seems like a very high touch process, at least just hearing about it secondhand. And I know a lot of our programs that we work with, a lot of the programs represented in this audience, they're dealing with significant scale. Do you have any thoughts about applying this kind of model to a lot of teams at once and doing so efficiently? Well, that's why we're developing this new online product so that as teams form, they can, we, we actually have a, a process and product um, online learning um, process that will be available in um, August that um, we'll be able to take it to scale. Because I know there's, it, programs are so time pressed and we have um, so many requests from higher ed about how to make this, how to bring this to teams or to actually to learners in general, because it's actually applicable for anything, not just team learning, but for any internship. And honestly, it's such an empowering process for students to learn this. Okay, great. And that is all the questions for now. So if it's okay with you, I'll go ahead and jump into some of the survey results. So I just want to clarify, this is only to preview the survey results. We still have some coming in and I don't have time here to get into everything. Unfortunately, we, we asked 19 different questions. So we will do a follow up uh, communication and I'm not sure yet if that'll be a webinar or a blog post, but we will, we will for sure publish all of the results later once results stop coming in. So we had, and you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So we had 65 uh, participants so far, and just to level set and show you where these folks are coming from, a lot of business schools, a lot of engineering, but honestly more uh, multidisciplinary than I expected. We define multidisciplinary in the survey prompt as spanning multiple colleges. So this is not multidisciplinary within an engineering school or a business school, which is a lot more common, uh, at least from my experience. This is truly uh, interdisciplinary across the entire uh, university or at least across two colleges. So I, I just thought that that was interesting. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So one of the questions that I, it seems to be coming up in a lot of schools is do we make an experiential project component required or not? It both carry pros and cons. I don't know that there's any one right answer to this, but we wanted to find out how common is it to have it be required. Uh, and the bulk do have required, but if you go to the next slide and if we filter these results, for business school specific versus engineering school specific, uh, we see what I kind of expected. It's much more common to be required in engineering. Um, also, multidisciplinary had a lot of requirements, but that's not represented here. When you go to business schools, only 34% had a required component, uh, which I thought was interesting. Keep in mind, this is including undergrad and grad, so we're not filtering for one or the other right now. 
Um, but engineering has been doing this a lot longer than business schools. So I talk to business schools, it'll say, we've been doing this for a long time. It's been 15 years. Engineering has been doing this for decades in a lot of cases. Um, and I think that also brings pros and cons, which I'll get to in a couple of slides. But one of the advantages of that is it truly is baked into the curriculum. It's almost not a question. It's expected to have a requirement. Um, I don't know that business schools will ever have that similar level of requirement emphasis. I guess that's a question for everybody in the audience. But uh, I do look forward to doing this survey again next year and the year after and starting to see trend data. So we don't have historical data on this question, but I look forward to seeing is the number of uh, requirements going up. I suspect it will be. You can go to the next slide, Kay. Okay, so another question that we thought was interesting was, do you have a formal director or an entire office? Either one would satisfy. And as expected, most schools don't have this. Again, I think once we have trend data a couple years into this annual survey, I think we're going to see this number growing substantially. But on the next slide, we'll see uh, something I thought was surprising. But when you think about it, I guess it does make sense. Business schools are much more likely to have a dedicated office than engineering schools. And I think this is maybe the downside to having a long history of experiential uh, project based learning like engineering schools have. They've been doing it for a really long time, and it's almost always in silos at the college level. It's part of the curriculum, so it isn't really thought of beyond the classroom, at least in a lot of schools. Of course, there are exceptions, uh, whereas in business schools, a lot of their project-based learning programs began outside the curriculum. And so there's this bit of information in that DNA that we, we, you know, we should do experiential beyond just the confines of a classroom. And if you're going to do that, plus classroom learning, which is growing, then you, you kind of need... I think an office or a director. So I, my personal, you know, take on this from talking to a lot of different schools is that it is of huge value to have this office or a director, someone owning experiential. Okay, could you? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, you're on the right slide. I'm looking. Okay, go back. I'm looking at two screens. Mm -hmm. I got myself confused. Uh, so of course it's advantageous, but of course costs money. So that's the question: is does it make sense? Do we want to invest in it? I'm very much convinced over time we're going to see uh, this number grow. More schools with a formal director of experiential. You can go to the next slide. So this was an open-ended question. We just wanted to know what do you want to share with the community, and this gets to I think that need for. Uh, and a director of experiential or an office. It's having a consistent voice with community members or clients involved in the projects. Different faculty teach different courses, so you need at least one person to track what is going on across the board and build those client relationships. So we've, we've told our audience, you know, your, your questions will be anonymous, so we're not gonna present who had said these things, but this was actually something that came up across a lot of different responses, but I thought this one really captured it well. Um, if you don't have a unified voice that you do project-based learning at your school, you know, you can still have fantastic experiential opportunities, of course, but things will be a little bit more confusing, I think, for the employers you interface with. And I, I very much agree with this, this insight. On the next slide, same question, what kind of uh, advice do you want to share to your other schools? Look for value added projects that will keep the employers fully engaged. I almost didn't put this here because it probably sounds obvious to say this, and I'm sure many of you are already doing this, but I know at a lot of schools, they're kind of taking the projects they can get, not necessarily always the projects they want. And it does seem like a downside of getting a project from an employer who isn't really serious about the outcome of the project is they end up not that engaged throughout the project. So there's no super easy fix to this, right? Um, but I think having, you know, to the former question, having a consolidated presence about your experiential program online and to be messaged to these employers through your various offices at your schools who are already touching the employers, career services, alumni relations, et cetera, that's going to help with getting a good, healthy pool of available projects. And then from there, you know, you can always look for the projects that seem the most meaningful to the prospective clients. And then one more uh, insight on the next slide. What is one piece of advice you want to share? Random events that make you think it is all going to crash and burn are going to happen. That's the real world. And it is a valuable experience for the students. I thought this was super interesting. And it's a little bit counterintuitive, right? Things are going to go bad, but that's okay because that can be the value for the students. There's a critical mass here. If things go too bad, programs can implode. I've seen it happen a couple of times, but it's super, super rare. Almost always it works out. And even if the client on the project, you know, doesn't take the deliverable and do anything with it, they still got brand exposure to your students. Your students still got a learning experience. Your students maybe hated the project, 
well, they learned about something that they hated. That's real world. And then obviously there are a lot of projects that go a lot better than that. But I just wanted to make sure we publish this because for those of you who've been doing projects for a long time, you've seen this. But when I talk to folks who are new to employer projects, they're scared of what happens if it goes wrong. Is this my reputation on the line? And I think this is a good uh, level check that, no, in fact, that can be part of the process and that can be OK. And as long as you're diversified and, and the clients you work with, with a number of clients and you communicate to them up front, this is not work for hire. This is doing a project with a team of students. Their learning is foremost, but we want to get you a good outcome, too, where we can. Then I then I think it all works out. So that's the end for my little survey blurb. Um, if you go to our website eddysource.com later today we will have a link up in the, the banner at the top if you want to participate i know a lot of you already have and we're going to keep that open for at least another week or two and then we will be uh presenting the full results and, and publishing them back to the community um david if i that was the last slide that you just put up is such a great example of when learning is needed and um this idea of having a an experiential learning champion at a school in a director or whatever role they play. Um, but I, I do want to say two things. One is that we have an experiential learning certification program for people it, just in that role, you know, educators, um, managers who actually can learn about experiential learning in the way we've talked about it today. But when they can bring that attitude to um, really this learning attitude and sharing a language of learning to situations like you just described in the last slide where projects crash and burn. Actually, learning can occur because you're going to approach it with client companies as a process as well as just an outcome. And it really makes those conversations so much easier. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic insight. And as just as personally as an entrepreneur, I mean, it seems like second nature. Of course, things can fail. And of course, that's OK. There's there's learning that happens. Anyone who's been an entrepreneur can vouch for that. You learn from when you mess things up. And, um, you know, that's that's as important a tool as any. So I agree. I know for a lot of schools, they would love to have a director of experience or someone in that role. But because of budget reasons, it often just falls on someone's shoulders and maybe they didn't ask for that or maybe they, they aren't being compensated additionally for it and it's a it's a time sink uh, but there are a lot of those people out there and they generally are very passionate about project-based learning so you know, i think it's a good idea to have a, a program like that to get those people up to speed yeah well please if anyone has any questions please contact us um, my email is uh, peterson at experiential learning institute.org and um, just, we love to support people who are interested in experiential learning. We also have a community of practice. If you go to our website, um, there's a place for you to join. We have virtual meetings three times a year, and then we meet once a year in person. And our actually, our conference is coming up in two weeks um, in Cleveland, Ohio. So thank you so much for allowing me to share this with you today. And I'll look forward to following up with you at some time in the future. And thanks, Kay, for taking the time and appreciate everybody in the audience for joining us. This recording will be posted online, so you'll be welcome to share that with folks if you want or revisit it if you wish. Um, and then I'll, I'll send out contact info to everyone as well. Uh, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you on the next EduSource webinar, which you should look for that in the fall.